comrade uh, president of uh, past president Tabumbegi uh, Sizanele, comrade Mashatile, TG and acting SG. Um, of course, program directors, I should have started with you. Uh, all the people who are listening uh, here and those who are listening from the remoteness of their homes. Thank you very much. Throughout this week, the commentary on uh, Aunt Lindywe Mabuza's passing has been filled with uh, abundant praise for her manifold accomplishments. She embraced, supported, and flourished in the arts. She has been described as a diplomat par excellence, and this predates the period when she was formally appointed as ambassador or high commissioner. So many, many things were said in superlatives. The family is very delighted that you have, in our hour of grief, been able to console us and actually confirm our understanding of uh, who she was in character and in personality. We thank you very, very much. I can't help but include that uh, maybe an element of hype in this, but the ambassador of Sweden said something like, without Lindy where Sweden might not have been what it was towards South Africa. A little bit of hype, but that's fine. Now, at a slightly closer range, many will not, that many will not have heard. First, about this art collector. I wasn't aware of this aspect of her. You know, she went to the States and other places before we met. She was older than us. Um, and also having heard about the composition of the family, she grew up uh, where we didn't see her. So we went, I wasn't aware of this aspect of her uh, attribute as, a, as an art collector when I traveled on government business to London when she was high commissioner. You know, uh, I did say I would be coming and she immediately said I should live with her. Uh, stay with her for the period that I was there. But you didn't quite say no to her. So I agreed. As a rule, I pick up presents for people when I visit them at uh, the duty-free shop. Uh, a whiskey or a cognac uh, or a fragrance, if I know the person, are the easiest things to choose. This time, well, I didn't know her fragrance, but also I wasn't going to buy her whiskey, so I went to the curio shop and picked up some um, carving. It wasn't expensive at all. Um, actually, it was a bit cheap, cheap uh, which I was going to present to her on arrival. I did that, and uh, she said, oh, Mozi, thank you, put it there. <laughs> so I, I knew exactly after looking at what was in that living room that uh, my gifts did not quite have a place there. And if I had a way, I would have really withdrawn drawn them very quickly and put them back into, into this thing. It was an African carving, all right, but not the Maconde that somebody was talking about here. So that was my first experience at close encounter, in close encounter with Aunt Lindy. Then on a visit to Germany, I was very lucky to visit where she was, uh, where she was ambassador. I played on a disc um, music that I thought was beautiful, uh, a rendition of Nkosi uh, Sigalele Africa. I really will not say who had uh, done that piano rendition of it, which I thought was excellent. So uh, she said, who is playing that? I said, who it is? So, uh, oh, I see. Where does he come from? 
So that's a person I understood later who had been invited by the apartheid government to play at the time of the boycott and he had agreed to do some music and that was the end of his relationship with uh, Aunt Lindy and that was the last time I myself also listened to that, uh, to that uh, recording. That's Aunt Lindy, anybody who t and, uh, plays around and um, messes up with apartheid cannot entertain us, cannot sing our national, national anthem. So many people, uh, Lindy you've provoked me, talk about how large our family is. It is indeed very large. And Lindy Wemabuza, as has been said, and Uncle Stan Sangweni, known to many who are listening and present here, were siblings. Their father, Mac Kambulin. Aunt Lindy's mom was a Miss Msibi who married because Kambule didn't marry her. Married a Mabuza. Stan's mother was a Ma Kumalo. This Kambule also didn't marry her. So she went to marry a Sangweni. So great guys, these Mabuzas and the Sanguinis, because they picked up these two people and recognized them. Um, Tembi's father, Tembi here, the late George Msibi, well, was Msibi. Tembi's grandmother was a Msibi. So you have Aunt Lindy making a baby with Msibi, who is, uh, carries the mother's name. As Lindy said, in to Savantabatala, which we can't quite uh, talk about. Also, this uh, Kambule, Mac Kambule's father, that's uh, Stan's grandfather, was a Simeon Kambule, who married a Miss Molefe. Molefe. Mac also married a Miss Molefe. Try and figure this out. So Mac Kambule, Stans and Lindy was delinquent father, was the brother to my maternal grandmother, Lambasa Kambule, who married uh, my grandfather called R.H. Uh, Kumalu. Their daughter, Sisonke, married Walter Msimang, my father, who was also not very good at retaining wives. Never mind. <clears throat> All this is in my generation, and I'm not really going to start talking about the rest of the other people who are in this house and who are elsewhere. The um, Kuzwayos, uh, th there is no end to them. Even the Sawazis, and I'm home live here, so. Uh, that's a story for um, somebody else to tell. Now, our great, little bit of my story, who we are, my great, great grandparents, who were Job Kambule, Johannes Kumalo, Adam Molife, and Mavuso, Daniel Msimang, were converted to Christianity at a place called Mparane, near today's town of uh, Fixback. They traveled to Edendale, via Eswatini, because the king there had also said he wished to have his people uh, converted to Christianity, but he was also very interested in them um, uh, gaining literacy. They passed on to Indaleni from Swaziland when there were some problems, stayed at Indaleni because the colonial government was keen to give the land to Afrikaners, and so these missionaries uh, uh, had to proceed and they went to Edendale. So at Edendale, because these guys already had some education, association with uh, missionaries, they were artisans, 
they really were ahead of the curve when it came to entering the colonial market. People used to call them Amazemtiti because they were exempted from native laws, certain native laws. And that's a kind of something of an honor that they thought they were really regarded with. I don't have the permission of the family to say this, but I'm usually known to say things that are most of the time truthful. Uh, I'll inform you that Job Kambule was the first superintendent of Edendale settlement. That was a huge settlement like the hill towns, Amanzimtotis, all these places where Christians were, Amakoboga and so on. He was superintendent there, but they called him Induna because uh, superintendent was reserved for the head of the Wesleyan missionaries. Now, he was very highly regarded. He'd been a teacher already, uh, earning 15 pounds a year uh, at Mparane. Uh, and so when he was appointed to this pos position as a convert, the understanding was that uh, he led a monogamous, monogamous, <laughs> monogamous life. Um, it turned out that he had a family in the village um, and when that was learned, Kumalo suggested a special time of prayer. For Edendale was the city of their solemnities and could not be allowed to slide into spiritual decrepitude. So Job Kambule resigned, had to resign as, as superintendent. So when you hear about uh, Lindy Stans and many other people's father, via Mac Kambule, I think it's the Irish who say, what's bred in the bone um, comes out, I think, in the flesh. Uh, I would like to say also, the Msimangs come in in this way. Uh, this Daniel Msimam, Mavuso, uh, was a serious Christian. He established the mission in Mparane in Eswatin. That mission stands today, he built it, um, and it's a national monument, uh, uh, Swazi National Monument. Uh, he had a son by the name of Joel, and Joel had two sons, one of them called Richard, another one called um, Selby. So Joel, I think beginning to smell something about the hierarchy in the Methodist Church, established his own church. It was called the Independent Methodist Church in Swaziland. The sons were the founder members of the African National Congress. Selby Simang having been the first administrative secretary, not SG, while uh, Blighty and Richard were entrusted with the task of documenting the difficulties that ex people experienced when, uh, as a result of the Native uh, Land Act of 1913. They compiled a huge, huge document which became should be in the archives of the African National Congress. He also, having trained abroad, was the head lawyer responsible for putting together the constitution of the African uh, National uh, Congress. So I just want to say that uh, the, what the president said, what uh, Ms. Barbara said, what uh, the poet said here about the African National Congress. They are talking about an institution that's very close to this family, extremely so. And sometimes when certain people say things that are not terribly popular, it's because they believe that the ANC should remain what its founders wanted it to be. This is this family. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for those words, Dr. Msumang. Um, to give the obituary today, I would like to call on Dr. Sli Mayeza. Dr. Sli is one of the many young relatives that were raised um, by Gokolindi, um, a doctor by profession. There's this, I can never say this word, an anesthetist by profession. She flew down from Cape Town um, a few weeks ago to be with Gokolindi and to help the family and we're extremely grateful for her for being such a rock for Tembi and everyone um, in Goko's final days. If you will all please rise as Dr. Slee gives the obituary. The obituary of Lindiwe Mabuza. This was as written by her brothers, Mendim Simang and Stan Sangweni, for the nomination of their sister, Lindy Mamabuza, for the national orders in October 2013, and completed by her granddaughter, Sisong Kem Simang, December 2021. Ambassador Lindy Mabuza was a dedicated cater who gave her life to the cause of the liberation of, South of all South Africans. She gave the struggle against apartheid everything she had, her intellect, her enormous reserves of energy, and her sharp communication skills. Her weapons were art, music, and culture, and she wielded them with finesse. Born on August 13, 1934 in Newcastle, the daughter of Makalem Elijah Kambule and Elsie Mtutukile Msibi, Ambassador Mabuza attended primary school in Johannesburg and went to high school at St. Louis Bertrand High School in Newcastle. In 1955, she was admitted at Roma College in Lesotho and obtained her Bachelor of Arts degree. Following this, Ambassador Mabuza moved to Swaziland and became a teacher of English and Isizulu. She was guided in her passion for language by her mother, Uma Kumar, who raised her on a diet of Zulu philosophy and culture. Ambassador Mabuza left Swaziland in 1964 on a Fulbright scholarship that took her to Stanford University in California where she studied for a master's degree in English literature. After she completed her program, Ambassador Mabuza moved to Ohio State University, where she became an associate professor, teaching courses in literature, history, and racial justice. She later went on to Minnesota, where she obtained a second master's degree in American studies. Ambassador Mabuza stayed on at the University of Minnesota to teach and taught sociology. She was part of a pioneering program, a proud African woman teaching Americans how to think about themselves. It was in Minnesota that she first experimented with using arts to capture the imaginations of those who needed liberation. She worked with a group of at-risk students, teaching them creative writing and poetry. Her time in America was formative. During these years, Ambassador Mabuza began to reflect on the cruelty of the regime that had taken power in South Africa when she was a teenager, and she increased her participation in the international anti-apartheid movement. She quickly built linkages between African Americans and South Africans. It was the civil rights era, and solidarity was quickly forged. In 1977, at great financial and personal risk to herself, Ambassador Mabuza cut short her academic career and joined the ANC in a full-time capacity. That year, she moved to Lusaka in order to be based at the headquarters of the ANC. She was soon deployed in the ANC's communications department where she became a journalist and researcher for Radio Freedom. She recorded poems and messages using her skills to devastating effect in stinging verbal attacks against the regime. She also became an active participant in writing for and editing The Voice of the Women, an ANC journal. Between 1977 and 1979, Ambassador Mabuza chaired the ANC's cultural committee, contributing enormously to the ANC's active decision to use culture as a terrain of struggle. She played an important part in raising the profile of the Amanda singing troupe during this period, and she worked tirelessly 
to promote cultural boycotts of apartheid South Africa. In 1979, she was appointed as the ANC's chief representative in Scandinavia and was sent to Sweden to fulfill those responsibilities. She quickly proceeded to open offices in Denmark, Norway, and Finland. The ANC's presence in Scandinavia became a significant source of solidarity and political and moral support for the ANC and a crucial pillar in the international movement against apartheid. It was here that Ambassador Mabuza's career as a diplomat began to take shape. Long before she was bestowed with the formal title of ambassador, she served as a crucial liaison between the black masses in South Africa and people of Sweden through the government. She is widely recognized for having consolidated and cemented the work of her predecessors. It was during her time in Sweden that she mobilized Swedish schools, unions, NGOs, and civil society groups to raise funds for the establishment of the ANC school in Tanzania, the Solomon Mashangu Freedom College, which became the educational base of many exiled children who had fled South Africa. After Sweden, Ambassador Mabuza was assigned to the United States of America. Here, she picked up her old networks and developed new ones. She reached out to artists like Quincy Jones, Alfred Woodard, Danny Glover, and Harry Belafonte. She also forged deep relationships with senior African-American lead, African leaders like Reverend Jesse Jackson, Randall Robinson, Representative Maxine Waters, Representative Barbara Lee, and famed litigator Johnny Cochran and many others. These political and cultural icons became a crucial part of the ANC strategy for challenging apartheid using hearts and minds in the 1980s. She was at her most artistically creative during this period, penning numerous poems and publishing widely. Her publications from that period include Malibongwe, One Never Knows, From ANC to Sweden, Letter to Letter, and Africa to Me. When Nelson Mandela was released in 1990, Ambassador Mabuza was central to organizing his first trip to the US, setting up media interviews and brokering meetings with key leaders. When the ANC won elections in 1994, Ambassador Mabuza went to Parliament for a brief period before being assigned to represent South Africa as head of mission at our embassies in Germany, Malaysia, the Philippines, and finally the UK. She served each of these with passion and distinction, promoting South Africa as an investment and tourism destination and showcasing our country's remarkable artists and designers. After retiring, she remained active in the church, returning to her foundational years of Catholic Catholicism. She also continued to write and publish, and her children's books, poetry collections, and extensive archive are a testament to her rich intellectual life. After the end of apartheid, she published Tambo Lenyoka, which is a poetic celebration of her mentors, Oa Tambo and Tabo Mbeki. Conversations with Oa Tambo and her children's book, South African Animals. Before her passing, she was close to completing her autobiography and was working on a new book about Sweden. She received many honors, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland in 2003, the National Order of Ikamanga, one of South Africa's highest decorations in 2004, and the Lifetime Achievement Award for Arts Advocacy in 2017 by the Arts and Culture Trust of South Africa. By far, one of her greatest moments was in 2019, when she was decorated with the Royal Order of the Polar Star with the rank of commander, bestowed upon her by King Carl XVI Gustav of Sweden for the significant role she played as chief representative of the ANC whilst in Sweden from 1979 to 1986 in raising awareness among the Swedes about the injustice of apartheid and garnering support for the struggle. She passed away peacefully on the 6th of December at the age of 87 in Pretoria, surrounded by loved ones. Ambassador Mabuza is survived by her beloved daughter, Tembelise, her grandchildren, Sifiso and Tutukile, her sisters-in-law and lifelong friends, Angela, Zandi, and Unica, and scores of nieces, nephews, and grandchildren, and her sister of the heart, Barbara Masagela. She will be remembered for her generosity in providing opportunities to scores of young people, her fearlessness in the face of injustice, 
and her capacity to claim her space among all people, amongst people of all walks of life. She taught us how to walk with our heads held high. Lala ngotolo, mzilagata, pangazita, ngube, malandelilang, wena wasebutlin, unga obunga ngagazi. Thank you. Thank Lindiwe so much, Mabuza, given a special provincial official funeral here in Gauteng, I guess accomplished is an understatement when you talk about Ambassador Mabuza, when you listen to that obituary. She received many honours, including an honorary doctorate from the University of Edinburgh uh, in Scotland in 2003, the National Order of Ikamanga, one of South Africa's highest decorations. She passed away peacefully, we're told on December 6th in Pretoria, surrounded by loved ones. May us all rest in peace. We're gonna take a quick break. I'll get you more news next.